Iñak. I work at Nokia Networks and I'm going to talk to you about variadic templates and their expansions in various contexts. Uh, so let's start from an introduction. So I assume everybody here knows templates, right? They are a very useful tool. They let us do very cool stuff. I, uh, they also let us do some slightly less cool stuff. Yeah, they, so they are kind of easy to abuse, which sometimes is fine. So uh, standard main function uh, that compares two values can be templated on a type and generalized to work on many types. Uh, I don't really like this one. <laughs> I would prefer if it was something like this, which is kind of more useful in more situations. And to avoid having to type, having to have forward everywhere, I'm going to just say it should look like this. And Everywhere where I have uh, a construction like this on the presentation, please assume that I'm doing perfect, perfect forwarding, just for simplicity on the slides. OK, so that's templates. They are fine. They are nice. They are allowed us to do cool things. But what when you ha want to have a minimal value among multiple types? Uh, multiple value. Yeah, multiple values who, that may not be of the same type. And what when, you want, what when we want to bind functions to their arguments and uh, those functions don't exist for me. <laughs> they were just wrong. Uh, and what about types that we want to have param parameterized on many, on many different types or maybe values, but I will focus on type arguments. So we want something more. Uh, so we want a variant type that can hold value of any of the specified types. And so there is an implementation of variant. It's in Boost. And many people don't like it very much. I, uh, here's the declaration of Boost variant. I don't know how many of you actually can read Boost preprocessor. Uh, it's not very nice, and it expands to something like this. I didn't even bother trying to fit it on the slide. So it's not very nice. It generates a lot of uh, problems when you are trying to read error messages involving Boost variant. Uh, so this is one of the approaches that was used prior to variadic templates for types that could have more uh, parameters. So generate a list of many types that can be an argument and have some of them be just a uh, placeholder, placeholder type. And the other approach that was used uh, is something like this. So a recursive instantiation of a template. Uh, and it a concrete example could look like this. Uh, it looks kind of nice. It's very functional. Uh, but I have seen a, an, a stack trace that involved many functions that were that had this thing as a template argument, and the list was uh, 30 types long. <laughs> so there were 30 of these little guys in a row separated by spaces so most of the uh, most of the uh, most of what was printed to the console was closing triangle brackets uh, or parents i i can never get that word correctly uh, so neither of these approaches is nice and uh, doesn't they don't really scale very very well so in C++11, variadic templates were introduced. So we can have a function that takes 
uh, any number of arguments of any types, and we can call it with basically any anything. And we can have a class. I hope it's the blue is visible. Uh, we can have a class that's templated on many types, and we can instantiate it with many with any number of arguments. And so, how does it work? How how can we actually use this thing? So, uh, let's implement this main function. So. The primary overload will take the first argument, the second argument, and the rest of them. And we will first compare the first to one, the first two, and then depending on that, we will uh, recurse to determine the uh, minimal value of all of them. And of course, this is recursion, and we need a, uh, a uh, stop condition, so we will have an overload for just one uh, argument. So. This thing here just expands the pack of arguments that's called tail into a uh, comma separated list of uh, variables in this case. So basically when we call min with four arguments, the first thing that happens is we call, uh, the, we call a function that's instantiated to something like this. So these are the elements of the uh, pack. So, as you can see, it's expanded into a uh, comma sep separated list of them. And then we instantiate another one. And finally, another one. So, here's the interesting case. They, uh, the argument pack can be empty. So, uh, for, for this case, the uh, stop condition couldn't have been uh, a function that takes two arguments because uh, it would be ambiguous when called with two arguments. Those two overloads would be ambiguous. Okay, let's head into some uh, problems that have to be solved to uh, use uh, variadic templates effectively. So, tuple unpacking. There is actually a feature for this in, is it in 17? I think so. Yeah. So, but nah, this part of the presentation used to take whole, pr whole talks before 14. <laughs> and, okay, so a tuple is a generic data structure for holding a uh, sequence of types. Mm, so like a structure only without named fields. So tuple takes any number of arguments and we can instantiate it. Uh, we can use the helper function that will deduce the types for us. And we can use the standard get to uh, retrieve a uh, single element from the tuple. So that is en enough. And there's a certain category of people that don't really like standard tuple. And from the same day, <laughs> so it's not a type that Stephen likes. <laughs> Uh, so, what we want to do in this case, and it comes pretty frequently in generic code, we want to somehow store some arguments to use them later. We don't know the function yet, but we know the arguments. We want to store them and then apply, a f apply the, fun the function on them. Uh, it's easy to do in non-generic situ situations when we know all the argument types, so we can just called proper gets. And when we want to do it in a generic context, we need to generate a list of compile time integers uh, to actually get the values. So it used to be a problem, <laughs> but it isn't since C14. 
there is a very useful tool in the standard library. Uh, it's called integer sequence. There is a uh, alias for for this type uh, that's specialized. Well, that an alias that uses size t for the type called index sequence, and there is a helper that allows us to easily create index sequences. So you give it the size of the sequence you want, and it gives you the sequence from 0 to n minus 1. So that's very nice. Uh, so basically, we take a tuple, and we cannot really do this directly. We have to generate the uh, index sequence. So this is a helper overload, and later on we can do this. Uh, so uh, there is a pack of integers. We expand this into a sequence of get one, get zero from tuple, get one from tuple, get two from tuple, and so on. Uh, and this is in the standard library for since 17, and it's called standard apply. So that's kind of nice not to have to re-implement this for every case where you want to do something with a tuple, which comes pretty frequently in, a, in generic code. Okay, let's go to Sfine with variadic packs. So, uh, is there anyone here who doesn't know what Sfine is? Good. <laughs> Uh, but just to remind everybody, there is an able if that has the that has the member uh, type def only if the boolean is true, and uh, we can use it like this. But this basically doesn't let us use type deduction for function for the re return type of the function. We can also do this, which allows us to use ret return type deduction for the function. Uh, but it makes the uh, the symbols not as nice uh, because we are always going to have this uh, this zero here in the type, and again in error messages, it can it can be quite uh, it can hurt the re readability of error messages when used in many functions that happen to be printed at the same time. Uh, so let's try to do this. So basically, when you call, call this function with anything, this pack is empty. So it doesn't generate any actual arguments. So uh, the function doesn't contain any arguments that the template arguments that are not uh, actually important to the function. And there is only one slight problem. <laughs> it's a bug uh, in Clang that was reported four years ago <laughs> by this guy. It's not the last time he appears in the slides. <laughs> And uh, so, basically, if you, do, if you are not using Clang, this is very nice. If you are using Clang, then I'm afraid you have to keep using this. <laughs> uh, I hope this will be fixed at some point, although there it doesn't seem like there is much of an interest for this. Basically, all the updates that generate another modified date is a person adding himself to CC for this bug. <laughs> okay, another, another case of using variadic templates, uh, which uh, allows us not to generate a ton of recursive uh, instantiations, which is bad for both for uh, both uh, compi our compile times and in certain in certain uh, cases also for the optimizer 
which can't always figure out what's going on. Uh, OK. So there are some contexts where you can expand packs. Expressions, so list of base classes, list of arguments, and values or types. So basically, the primary place where you can expand is, is expressions. Anywhere an expression can be used. Uh, but not just as a statement, you can expand a pack. So we cannot declare something for every element of a pack, which would be nice for some techniques that involve, uh, for example, building overload sets from lambdas. Uh, and we cannot expand the statement. Uh, this is a direct uh, consequence of the fact that a, when you expand a pack, it's expanded into comma, a comma-separated list of the thing that is before, and statements are, statements are separated by semicolons, not by commas. But it causes problems, and we want to solve them. So what we want to do is call a function for every argument, argument of a function. And this doesn't work, and generates very confusing error messages. <laughs> so the, this one uh, points out somewhere here. And so the compiler expected a semicolon somewhere here after, it expect, uh, after this expression, and decided, well, maybe you have forgotten this semicolon. So I will try to do the right thing. And but, oh, you didn't expand this pack, even though it is expanded. So it would be nice if compilers actually gave nice error messages, like you cannot expand a pack into the statement. But bah, we don't have that. So let's try it. So let's make a function that swallows everything that's passed to it, does nothing with it. Uh, and so. An attempt would be to do it like this. We call swallow to create a context where we can expand an ex a, uh, a pack of expressions. And we, ins and we do that. So in reality, it will look something like this. Uh, we need this or something equivalent that's a value. Because if bar returns void, it doesn't work. Uh, <coughs> There is, of course, a proposal for regular void, which would uh, make this not needed, but we will have to wait for that for a while. So let's try to use it in a concrete example. We will try to print out every argument that's passed into the function. How many of you see the problem with this? Yes. So Clang is very nice and does the right thing, while GCC doesn't. <laughs> so the problem is, as pointed out, that the order of evaluation of function arguments is not, is it unspecified or just undefined? It's unspecified. As, yeah. So it can be evaluated in any order. We could also get like <coughs> two, then ABC, then one printed. So we have to fix that. And C11 actually provides a tool to do that. So uh, this thing is a thing that I like using instead of zero there. Because it, uh, it, uh, it more explicitly says what the, the code is trying to do. And like my Let's make swallow not a function, but a class or a type that has a constructor that works exactly the same as the function before. And you see it like this. So we have this nice uniform initialization syntax, which actually specifies that the order of evaluation of the arguments is from left to right. So now, when we call the function, 
we actually get what we wanted. Question? Yes. Um, I kind of missed that part as to how yeah, that works. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> Here? So how does that impose an order? Yeah. The standard specifies that the order of evaluation of arguments here, <laughs> due to brace in this, uh, the braced syntax, specifies the standard specifies the order to be from left to right. Okay, that's what I was yes. Because it's an initializer list. Or yeah. uh, it's uh, it's not an initializer list. It's the it's a braced initialization. But there is no initialized list involved. Yes? Um, currently, GCC <coughs> and Visual Studio do not properly insert uh, sequence points in the braced initializer syntax for classes. <laughs> oh. It, it probably does the right thing, but if you're doing anything well, with it, a sequence point, Well, OK, it does the right. So, so, so the comment is that uh, we should not be doing side effects here, because in GCC and MSVC, uh, uh, the compiler does not insert. Uh, specifically uh, in the constructor case. Yeah, specifically in this case, uh, it doesn't insert sequence points between the expressions. So do not invoke any side effects from here. Yes? Is that just printing? <laughs> 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 Such as modifying the same value in both. Yes? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if, if, I mean, here you have a non-uniform list of types expanded there, but if they were uniform, is there any danger that it would uh, turn into an initializer list in that case? Or is yeah. I mean, I, it, the question so is... A, a, an initializer list constructor for swallow, so it's like... Yeah, the question was whether there's a danger of this turning into an initializer list. But, look, all these expressions have the same type. It's a unit. <laughs> oh, all right. yeah. uh, even if unit wasn't there, right. all, these, all these expressions would still have the same type. Right. Because but if, if Swallow had an initializer list constructor, then would it match that one instead? If Swallow had an initializer list constructor, would it match that one then? Yes. But it doesn't have <laughs> for that specific reason. Yes. <laughs> I just want to point out that in C++ 17, they did make like call order evaluate the expressions left to right. So this will be in functions. They got voted at least in EWD. They got voted forward. So okay, so there may might be a change in 17 that says that uh, this also does the right thing. Okay. Uh, all right, and this works, and it's very nice. Uh, okay, let's do something weird. So let's try to do this. So the use case is uh, slowly, slowly drifting towards the last part of the talk, so a variant type that will, that will be shown. Uh, so basically, uh, we do not want to pay a virtual function call cost when we know all the types that can uh, exist in a variant. That, that would not be good. So it basically means two pointer accesses. So you first have to fetch the vtable in most implementations, and then you have to fetch the function and then call it. So that's not very efficient. And when we know all the types, that are involved, we can do better. So the basic idea uh, and an observation is that lambdas are, are expressions. So we should be able to do this. We, ha we have a variant of types. So it, and we want to print everything that's inside. So we tr uh, this is an unexpanded pack here, and I'm expanding expanding it here. Uh, it may this part may be a little confusing. So, 
T is a concrete type because of this that will be expanded later into a pack of lambdas. And this is expanded in place. Uh, index of is just a meta function that finds the index of a type in a sequence. So that's easy. Uh, so for every type in the pack, we are generating a lambda function uh, that prints the value. So it gets the value from the variant. I'm basically using the same syntax uh, uh, as for tuples to get the element of a variant. Uh, this would tr throw an exception if the, if the variant didn't hold the type that we are trying to get. Uh, so this should work, right? We, get, we create a, an array of function pointers to those lambdas. They do not, they do not capture anything, so we can convert them to... They, they are implicitly converted to function pointers. We define the function pointer type here. Uh, index just gives us the uh, currently active type in the variant. And we call the proper function. This should work, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, this may be the reason. <laughs> so, um, please tell me that was a GCC bug report. Yes, <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can show it to you later. But uh, this one is older. It's, yeah. it's a year older <laughs> by the same guy. <laughs> uh, so if you're looking for the backlist of GCC and Clang, this name will pop up quite frequently, uh, especially uh, in cases like this. So code that almost nobody writes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he likes to tinker with uh, language features. <laughs> so th this is five years old. And basically it says that GCC doesn't understand what's going on. And again, it gives very confusing error message. <laughs> so here, at this point, it generates an error message saying a pack has not been expanded. And here, it generates a message that n there is no pack to expand. <laughs> so it's kind of similar to the error message we had earlier. So I, I assume that the bug in GCC is that it doesn't properly propagate the information that there is an unexpanded pack outside of Lambda. But yeah, there is this. So uh, let's work around this one. So this is a simple enough meta function. Uh, I basically want to have something that I can instantiate without instantiating the actual type to use uh, type deduction on this. Uh, so this is a fixed version that actually works in GCC and Clunk. Uh, yes? Um, is there a reason that you wouldn't just use like a normal visitor pattern with a, like a polymorphic visitor in there that's templated in the same type? Uh, is there a reason why I wouldn't use a normal visitor pattern? Uh, but but this is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> if only it were. It's it's so self-contained. <laughs> it would be self-contained with a visitor pattern too if you use the auto um, lambda syntax. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Okay, but we can we can basically do. It this without uh, having to worry about GCC and having sl just slightly more boilerplate. Uh, okay, so this is this should be clear enough. And this is the same basic idea, only it's slightly uglier, uh, especially all this part. So instead of expanding a pack of lambdas, we expand a pack of function calls that return lambdas. And we have to pass the type inside the lambda somehow. So we use the meta function, or the tag type, whatever you want to call it, uh, to create something that carries the type information. Uh, 
this line isn't particularly uh, nice, but it works. You write it once and then copy paste it between all the different uses of this pattern. And then you return the function that's basically the same as before. <coughs> Clear enough? Okay. <coughs> so let's try to implement a variant type. Uh, it's not a standard compliant variant type. <laughs> uh, my implementation currently uh, doesn't actually support thing things that uh, throw when moved. <laughs> uh, I had some discussions with some people here about how you can support those types, uh, but it's not relevant. The simplest case is that we assume that nothing, no move operation throws for simplicity. So, okay. There's this thing in the standard library called, called aligned storage. Uh, this default alignment is pretty much 16. <laughs> so uh, it gives you a type that's, uh, that has the proper size to hold an object of this size and the proper alignment that's specified by the second argument. Uh, this is a type that likes to generate bugs <laughs> because people forget that it's only the uh, type def inside that's properly sized and aligned. Uh, thankfully, there is a helper, yeah, aligned storage D that does the right thing. All right, so the basics of the variant. We want storage for all the types that we can hold. This max is basically the same as the mean before. So uh, actually in my code, I have a fold here. <laughs> I'm folding on the uh, binary max, but whatever, whichever implementation works. Uh, and we have a, a variable that tells us which, uh, which type is active. Construction, uh, that's easy enough. And of is a meta function. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put all the meta functions on the slides. Uh, they are in the code. I have links to it uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, and they are simple enough, I think. So if this, ho if this holds for any of the types, this is, Basically, I'm, this is a constructor that works for every of the types. So we can pass every, any of the types here. It must be exactly the same type because it's a template, so there will be no conversions uh, going on. Uh, the constructor that actually allows to pass something that is convertible to something that can be held inside a, inside a variant is longer and invokes uh, two separate uh, workarounds for bugs in GCC <laughs> in different versions of GCC. One of them is, is, is 6.1. Uh, all right, so we just construct this. Everybody is familiar with this syntax? All right, placement new. Uh, so we just construct the thing inside the variant. Yes? Do you have to worry about two uh, variant with two of the same types, or are you just? Uh, do I have to worry about a variant of, with two of the same types? Uh, I don't. I think I have a static assert in my code that says that okay. you cannot have two of the same types. It basically will, uh, yeah, index of will never give you the index of the second uh, instance of the type inside the variant. So I might even not have the static assert there. I would have to check. Okay, so yeah. So this is simple enough. I uh, copy construction. Uh, I'm no, not going to show move construction because when ignoring uh, exceptions, uh, it looks basically the same. And when not ignoring exceptions, it's f like three times longer. Uh, okay, so it's the same pattern we saw earlier. Yeah. This time the function, 
which is a visitor of the variant actually takes two variants. Uh, because again, we cannot capture anything in this lambda because then we, it wouldn't convert to a function pointer and we couldn't do this. Uh, so I'm reaching inside the other variant, taking the value that's there and copy construction uh, copy, copy constructing uh, uh, the, uh, the value inside myself. Uh, the reason why I can just do this is, uh, is because I'm using uh, the tag, the index of the value that's held in the other variant to dispatch on those visitors, so I know the types are correct. Mm -hmm. Coffee assignment. <laughs> uh, this looked better without the workaround for GCC. So the basic pattern is the same. So only nested. So w first we dispatch on the tag inside our current, uh, our current variant, the one that we are assigning to. Uh, so we destroy the value that's held inside currently. Again, I'm completely ignoring the fact that some stuff made throw. Uh, and then we construct the other, uh, we copy construct the value from the other variant inside our storage and we dispatch twice and it works. Okay, so the structure is, is simple enough. It's basically the same thing. We dispatch on the type that's currently held inside the variant and destroy it. And there's some additional functions that help us visit the variant. So this is get and the variant. Uh, it takes the uh, index of the type we want to get. There's, uh, it's simply enough to implement another version that takes a type instead of an index. And we check if the type, uh, if the requested type is the type that is currently active in the variant. If it isn't, we throw an exception. And if it is, nth is again the nth type inside this pack. And we return a reference uh, to the value inside. And the last one is called fmap for, for reasons known to people what, knowing what a functor is. Uh, Variant can be uh, with this type and another uh, with this function and uh, and a function to flatten the variance. It's basically all the functor and monad laws hold. Uh, so this here is a variant that can hold every uh, every type that can possibly be returned uh, from here. Uh, I can show you the real code. I, uh, fitting it on a slide in a way that would be readable was not really fit, uh, possible. <laughs> so if you are interested in seeing uh, some meta functions that actually compute all of this, then I can show it them to you in a moment. So uh, we... <laughs> What? <laughs> so we have to find the result type. It's a variant of everything that can be returned. And the visitor type has to return this type. So basically all, all, the, all the functions that uh, we call must return the same type for, for the creation of this array to work. Uh, so this is computed first. We have a function pointer type. And again, the same thing. 
Uh, only this time we specify that we return the result type already here. And then we invoke this. Okay, so that's... Are there any questions to this? Yes. How is variant a functor? This is fmap. Uh, how is variant a functor? So this is fmap. So what fmap does for a functor is... Well, I know what fmap does for a functor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why? That? Why do you think a variant is not a functor? Because first, for something to be a functor, it has to have one of its type no. arguments, which changes. Uh, you are talking about unary functor. I'm talking about no, you are talking about. Okay, so functors have RET. So it's like an end functor. Yes, it is. It is an n functor. Okay. So this thing returns a, a, another variant? Yes. Okay. okay, then. A variant of all the possible types that can be the result of invoking this function on all the types inside the variant. Okay. Richard, did you have a question? It was similar. Okay. What is the practical use of that? The variant can only hold one type at a time, right? One value. One value at a time, yeah. So why would you want to apply to all of the different... This is the list, basically. <laughs> well, is the issue that you, you don't know what value it is, so you have to have a function signature that says, I've done the work you asked me of the variant, so you need to return, you effectively you need, the result of that function would be kind of everything possible. One of them would be valid, valid but it has to be all of them possible, right? So the question is how, basically the question is how this works. Yeah. <laughs> so, a, uh, there is a uh, quiet requirement here that f is callable for every type that can possibly be held inside a variant. So this thing, I can show it to you in a moment. This thing uses ba basically uses invoke to determine the type that the function returns for every of the types here. And then it creates a variant type that can hold every of those possible values. Yes, Richard. What if it returned void? Uh, what if it returned void? It doesn't work then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So your uh, function <coughs> passing into that for each one of the variants, alternative types, it can have a different result type for those different alternative types. Yes, the function that you are passing here can have a different return type for every of the types in the variant. Yes, that's the idea. Yes. I have a, a question about the lifetime of that. Because it looks like you're potentially moving it twice. Uh, where? With the step forward on the invoke inside the lambda of the lambda and on the return statement. Uh, the question is, am I moving f twice? No, I am not. Because uh, here, I'm forwarding it into here. Which could forward it one. So this, OK. Forward, forward. I'm forwarding it into a uh, function argument. I'm not capturing it. So I'm forwarding it here and forwarding it here again. OK. The, so that's everything I have on slides. Uh, you can find the variant type and tests for it over there. Uh, there's a lot more, more code inside. There's some code to support references by replacing them with reference wrappers. Uh, there is some additional constructors. Uh, so do you want to see more code that wouldn't fit on slides? <laughs> How? <laughs> more slides? No, 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 like in the text editor. Do you or not? Okay.
Where is that? Give me a second. Uh, so we on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is this all right? Okay. So uh, maybe let's head to the one that uh, we were looking at. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a comment that reminds me why this is here. Uh, so this is the return type. Uh, I can try to make it somewhat more readable. Uh, uh, boom, boom, boom. Oh, oops. No, not here. Okay, hopefully that's readable. So there are some utilities that I have for dealing with types and operations on types and so on. So what rebind basically does, it takes a uh, type that, it takes a vector of types. It's similar to MPL vector and rebinds it onto variant. So if you have a uh, vector of int float string and you rebind it onto variant, you get a variant of int float string. Uh, this is a pack of types. Uh, and it contains every type of, uh, every return type of a function call of forward. Uh, uh, this is a thing that deals with reference wrappers. Uh, it's not important, uh, not very important at least for for the purpose of this. Uh, so we have all the types that can be returned. Uh, unique does what it says, so it creates a list of unique types of all. So if if this here was a list of int int float, then after unique it would be int float, and we rebind it onto variant. So, yes. <laughs> as a question, like, so, uh, 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 so unique, so if, if, if the unique part of it is so that you don't have a variant with multiple values of this, or multiple types of the same. Yes. Um, okay. And do, uh, yeah, the. I, I don't think I, should, I have to repeat that. Uh, basically, it was a comment that unique makes a unique list. Uh, uh, to answer a question that might be following, uh, yes, this changes the rarity of the variant, possibly. Yeah. But that's OK. The laws hold. And C++ is, this might be a, uh, statement not everybody will like, but I think C++ is better for functors than Haskell <laughs> because uh, it has polymorphic functions that can do different things for different values. So you can make a tuple a functor, you can make a pair a functor, you can make a variant a functor, and everything works. Yes? Do you think it would be useful to supply an additional utility function for someone to know um, which uh, result type was um, given for a particular variance um, value that was okay so the, so yeah I, I, I understand the question I, I understand the question yes so the question is uh, whether it would be useful to provide a function uh, that would uh, not do this <laughs> but uh, provide you both the result of a function call and uh, like an index of the type that was active at the moment the function was called? Well, I mean, I, I think that map might be fine, but a way of mapping to know <coughs> which result type. Uh, so I think the thing you want to have done can be just done by first 
extracting the index of the currently active type from the original variant, and then calling fmap. But then how do I know which of uh, the resulting variant is the active type? How then do you know which of the resulting types is the active one? I don't understand the question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I'm sorry to be a stickler for vocabulary here, but yeah. I just give a talk on, on functors and things like that. Yes, I know. This is an n functor function. This is the map functor for an n functor. There are many different functors, uh, functor map functors that can work for the variant, but this is not one of them. So there's a, a, a distinction between an n functor and a bi functor and a functor. And this is implementation of an n functor, but I'm not really sure that it would be an n functor with your particular variant because it doesn't allow repeated types. But assuming it re does allow repeated types, you know, kind of like the standard variant is going to, then this would be the map function for an n functor. But it wouldn't, it's, that's the state from Okay, so, so the comment is that I might not be, uh, uh, I might be misusing some terms when speaking up, but okay. <clears throat> but the question is, uh, is that really relevant? Because uh, you have a... It's important to <coughs> <the right> <laughs> Especially when we're talking about mathematics. Okay, so it is a functor map. It's a map on a functor. So n array functor is a functor, right? No. No? Isn't, it isn't? Okay, I can rename it to nf map. If that's a problem for you. <laughs> it would be n map. I mean, f map is just a carryover from Haskell. But yes, it is. More term. All right. We can discuss the terminology later, I think. OK. Uh, does the fact that it changes the uh, RET, uh, is the fact that it changes the RET the thing that bothers you? or? No, it's the fact that we're, you're calling this the, the map function for a function. And like this is an n functor. Okay, so if it was n map, would it bother you that it can change uh, the rarity of the functor? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I guess we sh we should discuss this later. Uh, So I have some more weird code here, if you want to see it. <laughs> uh, like this. This is kind of because I, my the template fingers don't exactly work the way I want them to. Uh, so I hope you are not angry that I'm using th this name here. Um. <laughs> You probably are. <laughs> I wouldn't say angry. I just, I just want to make sure that you know people walk away with the right understanding as to what these mathematical concepts are. Because okay, so so it's not a functor. It's an n array functor, and it's an n array monad. It's an n functor. Okay, wow. and okay, all right. We have to disagree on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's an n array functor. I'm pretty sure. An Categories. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> there is there is a, a disagreement on terms in the audience. Okay. Do we also agree on calling this an NRE monad? <laughs> because the laws hold. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they do. If you say so. I'm pretty. Okay, so it. Okay, so it might not be uh, 
precise, uh, the precise term to call it an N monad. Uh, and again, I think the thing you pointed out that it can change RET when called may, might be a problem for this. I agree with that. So, uh, but other than that, I, I did not, uh, I did not experimentally uh, check the laws, but I'm pretty sure they hold. Like I, I'm not seeing a point where they don't. So function composition works. And, that, I, and I think that's the most important one of those. So, uh, yeah. So if it's a monad, then it's also an applicative functor. Yes. If it's a monad, then it's also an applicative functor. Uh, yes, an, an applicative NRE functor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, though I do not have the uh, applicative functions implemented yet. Uh, I guess uh, I kind of have. Because I have, uh, you would have to write a simple function, but I have uh, this thing here uh, is a visitor for multiple vec variants. So using this, you could implement every of those functions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> to virtual functions which require two pointer hops. Generally, yes. <laughs> require two pointer hops here as well, but I think the, uh, the difference, uh, not here, in, in your... Yes, I understand that. But yeah. The difference is the inlining that's possible. And I, think, uh, uh, I think that makes it quote unquote better. Uh, so yes, you have to fetch... You have to fetch the address of, uh, yes, the question is whether I'm actually only needing a single f uh, pointer fetch for this dispatching. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, uh, uh, I believe that when I checked in the generated code, yeah, uh, of course, there were the guards for initialization of the static array. Uh, it may be possible to make it consexpr. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that was bad. Uh, but I don't think there was actually a f uh, anything as costly as fetching a vtable for fetching the, the table of function pointers. Yes, uh, and I think the, the big difference is that uh, you enable the compiler to uh, yes, the difference is that, that I enable the compiler to inline some of this. I believe so, yes. Do we have any assembly output from a, a call? Uh, I had it somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, with the tiny font, it would, <laughs> I believe. Uh, that. I can try to m make it on like Godbolt to see what's going on, but not like while standing here. Okay. So we can sit down somewhere after after this and uh, look at it if you want to. Okay, thank you. <laughs>